Hi, Dave. This is the uh, Neo Books call for Monday, January 22nd, 2024. Um, Dave, are you back in Berkeley? I am in Berserkly. Yes, indeed. Excellent. There we go. Um, Hi, Hi, Jesse. Uh, for what it's worth, I, I think I need to leave at the top of the hour. Okay. Cool. Um, our major neo book writers are not on the call yet, although I'm I'm busy chugging away on design from trust. Um, and Dave, do you want to talk about what what's up with you? Yeah, Stacy. Um, uh, what's well, you know, the biggest the uh, hi, Stacy, Enric. Yeah, the biggest uh, in the last couple of weeks is getting moved to Berkeley. I guess has been the big the big accomplishment. Uh, we did spend a week in Honduras uh, with some snorkeling and scuba diving too. So that. that was rough. Yeah, it was it was tough. Um, and kind of digging back to the to the global regeneration collab. Uh, I owe you some stuff, Pete. I was gonna uh, following up on the Plex. I'm I'm way behind, but uh, I don't, I didn't know if you wanted a description of the GRC or if there were some other ideas that you had there. But um, uh, both. <laughs> okay. Um, and it's just kind of, you know, just like coordinating a community and what's it mean and how's the, uh, I was saying we had interesting information failures around hosting events and people ending up on different Zooms. And, you know, it's just kind of the, the practicality of information flow is really uh, a pain in the butt, but 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 a learning opportunity. And then uh, and then we're trying to figure like, what you know, where do we go in the next year? And can we, um, how do you shake something like that up? How do we change? what we're doing kind of in a way and if the environment around us is changing how do we evolve the system um and that's been kind of interesting so I'd be like trying to recruit a new person to like kind of run it for a couple of months or you know i don't know does it help to change coaching staff i mean what's mm -hmm. the what's the right strategy so um so that's been an area of thought and then the other one is kind of still thinking about this uh landscape regeneration stack which I still feel it's kind of neo booky, right? In that, in that, what you're trying to do is organize the intellectual capital that allows something to happen more effectively, right? So I want landscape regeneration to happen, and there's going to be a lot of technology required. Technology meaning tools and processes that are required for that. And the more we can compile those and organize them and make them interact, then the better off we're going to be, kind of long term. And that, and that intellectual stack is capital that's being managed, right? So in the capitalism sense, it's managed by commons, I guess. So how does it, what's, what's you know, what's the what's a commons-based capitalism look like, I guess has been one of my questions. And then another piece is that stack also looks a lot like an ecosystem map. Um, can you, you skip can that question? What's a commons, say it again? Well, I was, I mean, like one of the things that I've been wondering about is like the intellectual assets that make up this stack um, are intellectual, you know, we talk about them as, in, as capital. We have a, a growing body of capital. It is appreciating, right? It is cumulating, cumulating, but it's, it's not owned by Jeff Bezos. It's owned by the commons, but it's still capital and it's still being managed and we still want it to have a return, right? Um, those assumptions are capitalist assumptions about capital. No, they're, there, I that's what that's what I would like to know more about. I think yeah. there are assumptions about human progress, right? Um, I don't know that early humans worried about capital and and the increase of capital. I think they worried maybe about yield, like our crops are dying or how do we make them live. But but the notion of capital and the requirement for returns on capital are I think much it's, newer. So somebody has made a different differentiation in one of our calls between. Uh, profitism and capitalism. So what we usually think of, you know, Jeff Bezos is, is a, a profiteer uh, as much as he is, as he is a capitalist. He, um, he or an entity like him could be accumulating capital to push the capital back through the system. Um, but the way we're set up, uh, you know, you accumulate capital and power so that you end up with profit. And and I think there's a uh, a uh, you know like in, in microeconomics you would talk about consumer surplus you know and in some sense there's a 
there's a bar relate uh, uh, negotiation that goes on between the the supplier and the uh, the the buyer over who captures the consumer surplus, right? And with capital, it's a similar thing. I mean, you could drive down the return on capital and increase the size of the cap and and, and increase the size of the capital probably, but. But but I, I so the, maybe there I think the fun the question I'm probably you're pushing on Jerry that I wonder about is yeah. I think capital the growth in capital this intellectual asset represents uh, improvement in human status that that there is in fact a, a relationship between you know in, a, humans being better off and the growth in our capital and the issue we're really dealing with is like, well, who is it that controls the capital? We all want it to grow, right? We want that stack to get better. We want landscape regeneration to happen faster, right? I um, think we're, we're, we're both reacting, I think, to your control of capital comment. Pete, I don't know. I don't want to talk to you, but. No, I I, uh, I appreciate, I, I like the idea and I'm wondering about it, the uh, relationship between growth of capital and, and, uh, and increase in quality of human life. A different thing. Uh, the the one I was reacting to was we all want all want it to grow. Um, I the 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 growth thing bothers me. But can, if I said make it, it get better, well, yeah. But but uh, but I'm unconvinced that making lives better through growth of something is is a good goal. But he's swapping um, in the word um, improvement or better for the word growth. So like if you dropped growth and said improvement or better, would that be better? Well, I'm still concerned that growth is hiding behind there somewhere. Right, right. But uh, it's also in, a, but in the, it's certainly in the intellectual space, we're talking about something that's abundant. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that we're better off uh, than, uh, you know, an Amazonian tribe who's, who's not been changing their life for a thousand years and you know, it's, it's pretty cool. And, that, and I guess that that would be the really the fundamental. I think that's the bottom line question. And I, I don't know how you resolve that one. It's like take a poll or something like that. You know, I would rather be here today than I would be in the Amazon a couple of thousand years ago, I think. Although they may not have found the city I'd like to live in yet. So maybe it'll show up and then they just oh, found oh, it. that one looks okay. They just right? found they just found Ecuador. Yeah. yeah exactly. So it's like, well, maybe I wouldn't mind it. I don't know. But I, I'm pretty sure I would rather live today than back then. So and I'm pretty sure it's because to... of this growth in capital. If you were to compare the settlement back then with other settlements around the world of back then and had to choose which place to land on the planet in that era, you might have ended up choosing a place that understood how to use commons and create and create abundance. And here the word abundance is also tricky because there's a there's a fight between abundance and sufficiency or other words that mean having enough, where abundance seems to mean over sometimes seems to mean overproduction, right? Uh, thriving is another great word, exactly. And and so um, abundance comes with its own little bit of baggage. And then I put in also property, ownership, control, all those kinds of things. In, in commons, you have to control some things to have thriving commons, it seems, or that's what Lynn Ostrom's Principles for Governing uh, Commons would say. Um, otherwise, you like commons can, can break because they don't naturally, like it, it, once humans get involved, they don't naturally keep going. But, but all of this stuff is, is kind of tied together into a vision because your first, your first question about what is the, the stack, what does the landscape regeneration stack look like? I'm totally in on that. That sounds great to me because I've got this notion of stacks also in my conversations and landscape regeneration is really important for me too. So I, I was with you there. It was when all these other terms that that are freighted in different ways for each of us showed up that I was like, well, well, it's a it's a part of the the. So if we were to try to step back and 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 have a a global bank account, right, that was owned communally in some ideal way. Did you say global right? bank account? A global bank account, a cap, our our portfolio of capital, okay. right. And we were trying to collectively have a, uh, we want we we want to have a, a return on that investment. We, we, we think we can do better. We can use it to do better. We can get smarter and more capable and we can have more people educated and they can live better lives, right? So we're, we're so instead of Jeff Bezos, we have the, a we kind of playing that role of, of manager of the capital. And so I think there is kind of a global accounting 
right? That 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 tries to, I don't know if you have to maximize the return on capital, but you would like to see a positive return on your previous investments. And I think that's a natural human instinct, right? I want to learn more, right? I'm, I can do better. I can go faster. I can, you know, we, you look at professional, I was like thinking about professional football and how incredibly good these people are. It is so stupid, right? But damn, they're good at it. Right. And, and so we've taken this thing and we've decided we're just going to keep getting better. At it. And I kind of think that's a human characteristic. And I think our capital reflects that, that will, you know, the landscape stack, we, we have to have that landscape stack improving in order to kind of meet our requirements for thrivability, I think. But the system, that's where the ecosystem around it has to be dynamic enough that it drives improvement. And does that require a capitalist or can we do that in the comments? Professor Kaminsky. Um, thanks, Dave. I, I, uh, I um, find the comments uh, intellectually very interesting. Um, I, I don't think it's a natural human condition that uh, everyone wants to get better or wants to see continual improvement or anything like that. I think that's a, a virus that we caught a couple thousand years ago and, and, um, and you know the the dominant cultures, uh, the Asian, uh, you know Chinese culture and the European culture, killed everybody that that thought different. So now we're we're caught on this treadmill of like, well, it's got to get better because it's got to get better because you know we've been doing it, and literally, I, th I think we killed off vast swaths of human culture that that are good enough just being good enough. The the reason you know the reason I can say Amazonian tribe. Is because we killed everybody else. We just haven't gotten around to killing the Amazonian tribes quite yet. We did a really good so job those too. The, so the funny thing is, you know, that's the I I think over the and this is a little bit of an argument from Dawn of Everything, but I, I think over the course of you know the past 10 or 15,000 years, we've had lots of cultures and lots of cultures were perfectly fine just with kind of a status quo and eating enough and, you know, sleeping more than us and just kind of hanging out and having a good time. And I think it's really hard for people in our culture to even like think that way. So um, I, I do appreciate where you're going with it, even though I kind of disagree with a lot of it, I think I do appreciate, you know, we can't flip a switch and make us all you know, living in a, a culture from 10,000 years ago, we just can't. So we're, we're stuck transitioning between where we've been for the last 100 years and where we need to be in the next 200. And, you know, deconstructing the, the capitalism, profitism, uh, progress uh, arguments uh, and, and loosening up a little bit and looking at the things that actually work and the things that don't, um, the things that we might need, being able to say, you know, okay, I get that we want to make progress and I get that that's tied to capital and uh, increase in capital and, but maybe we should have that owned by the commons rather than by a uh, hundred rich white guys. Um, I, I think it's really important to have that transition story out of where we are to a better place. But, but overall, I, I kind of, I'm not sold on the, you know, people, want to get better people want more people you know so thanks yeah it's super stimulating dave um i've got a bunch of sort of resources on on things hard-earned wisdom things that humans learned over time over generations and how they pass it down in pre-written societies so oral oral tradition societies where once you learn to speak and pass things on and i think that's a very nice milestone is like you get some kind of language so you can pass things on in a more organized way. Uh, but then what happens? And practices like when you harvest eggs out of a clutch of eggs, don't take all of them. Leave, a, leave an egg or two behind so that the animal can reproduce and be back there. When you pull up the roots in a particular area, don't take all of them. Leave a couple and then spread a couple more around so that the next time you come back, there's a little bit more. Now, that doesn't presuppose a finite bank account of assets. That doesn't presuppose growth uh, as a, a requirement. That doesn't, all it says is, don't kill off the thing that just fed you. And, and if you do that over and over and over again, the landscape just gets better and better. And we thrive as a community over time. And, and there's no concept that any part of that is fixed or finite. 
Although maybe by what I'm saying is don't kill off the thing that fed you. That's a kind of fixed or finite. It's like, it's like, you know, if you were to take all of everything you touch, you might in fact end up with very little at the end. And I think that was a hard won realization because the cultures that killed themselves off were the ones that exhausted their resources. So famously, if you chop down all the wood, you no longer have wood to burn in the winter. Any numerous examples of cultures that without being overrun by the neighboring culture, which is the other big problem, Managed to wipe themselves out by by you know resource overconsumption. There's a an idea that the Mayans who disappeared like that uh, probably disappeared from resource overconsumption. Although I haven't really checked in on on what the latest theories about all that are. Um, so when you say that the instinct to grow or get profit or increase from your assets, I think you're putting a really modern frame on very old behavior. Um, and, and the notion of ownership, capital, assets, money, that everybody needs money to stay alive is 1700, 1600. It doesn't really predate that, as far as I know. Um, before that, we're just trying to make a living. And, and before that, we're being, if you're a peasant anywhere on the earth, your, your blood is being squeezed from you by whoever dominates your land, whether it's your church or your king or whatever. You don't want to be a peasant kind of anywhere in modern Western society and also in a lot of Asian societies. Uh, because once rulers have enough power to control people and to send military or or police or their private army in, you're, you're kind of screwed. Um, one of my big puzzles is how can you be a smart pacifist society that takes care of its landscape and survive onslaughts from all the people who aren't? Because that seems to break all the time. Go ahead, Stacey. Yeah, so I do want to say that I, I do think that there is a natural instinct because of our curiosity and because of our need to create, to want to do better. And I think the conversation might take a bit, a more productive term if we looked at how we measure that added success, because where we have to stop measuring it is in terms of capital, you know, as far as as far as financial, as far as money. But and because so much of what we do is, you know, we just do it because that's the way it's always been done. Changing the conversation to that where we value other things and and think of that as part of how productive something is. I think that would be helpful. Um, I totally agree. And uh, I'm, I'm wondering, for example, how things get passed down. When I say hard one wisdom, one of the things I think happens a lot is these stories get passed down. But then some of these stories get ironed into religions that don't make a lot of sense, but we do them anyway because our ancestors did them. And some of those are really unproductive. And some of those were fabulous. And if you stop doing them, you like you endanger the tribe. And how do you know which is which? And how do you how do you promote curiosity so that you can innovate, a pretty modern word, but you so you can invent new stuff that makes our group better. Uh, better off next year than we were this year or next decade than we were this decade and how do you pass that story on to the next generation I, th I think for me one of the reasons for religions is to codify the hard-won wisdom and pass it on in some more rigorous way because the passing on breaks really often and i don't think that that worked well either necessarily i mean uh, the dietary rules for islam and judaism seem to be sort of like that although a lot of the dietary rules make little or no sense so I don't know. It, 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 yeah. And it's, so, so our culture now has kind of lost that wisdom, though the the you know leave an egg behind thing. Uh, we've gotten back to the point where it's like, well, if I'm an oil company and I can make profit, and that's going to destroy the world for everybody else for 100 years or 200 years or 1,000 years, yeah, we still win. So. You know, that's the right thing to do. I it, it reminds me the last dodo birds were killed by you know, museum, uh, museum uh, curators. It's like, well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's only six left, but we need to get ours for our collection. So I'm going to club that one and maybe that one too, just for the heck of it. It's like humans, man. Humans are a virus on the planet. <laughs> well, Dave, thank you for sending us down a a fun way. Um, there's, a, there's a good rabbit hole. But yeah. one of the variations on the capital, the you know, the open capital issue has been, I, I haven't seen anybody doing that analysis, but I'm curious about the contribution of open source software to uh, international, like, 
uh, third world GDP, um, right? Because one of the byproducts of the commons, the open tools is that the return gets distributed in different ways, I think, instead of concentrated in Bezos. And so I don't, you know, we've got enough, we've got 20 years of experience now. I wonder if we haven't seen growth in, you know, Vietnam or Ukraine or Poland or something that's tied to Silicon Valley investments originally, but has gotten distributed into other communities. I have something on a completely different topic, kind of a check check in thing. Um, uh, and I think this relates to neobooks because it involves authoring text potentially creatively. Um, it, it turns out over the weekend, I bumped into uh, some, some folks in my AI clubs uh, that actually need version controlled text uh, a lot. Um, so if you're making a GPT, you're copying custom instructions into the little web, web page uh, for OpenAI. Um, and then you want to tweak it and then you want to tweak it again and whoops, oh shoot, I just typed over something or I like was, you know, I selected something and then typed and deleted things and there's no undo in the web interface. Um, so people have learned, non-technical people writing GPTs have learned that, wow, it's good to like copy and paste each version into a document. Um, or uh, uh, into a spreadsheet or something where you can keep track of a lot of versions. And I said, you know, <laughs> between Obsidian and Git, I know how to do this really well and it works pretty easily and it's not hard for non-technical people to learn. So um, so I had a 90-minute uh, session yesterday and I'll have a couple more this week uh, just showing people Obsidian and Obsidian and Git. So uh, for folks who don't know, maybe, I don't know if we have people who don't know Obsidian Git, but Obsidian is a nice text editor that includes file management stuff. And then if you add Git to it, um, you get a nice text editor that has file management stuff and can maintain a version of a file as deep as you want um, and, and can kind of navigate back and forth between those versions. It doesn't do that as, as easily. Um, so I'm teaching more people, non-technical people, uh, the, uh, in, in some, some places I call it prose fusion pattern. Some places I call it the massive wiki pattern. Some places I call it the obsidian git pattern. Um, it's a, it's a good pattern and it's usable for lots of different things. And I now I'm kind of inspired to push a little bit more, push us a little bit more towards that, uh, for new books too. At the same time, it's totally fine if you write a new book and whatever you want. Um, Google Docs, Microsoft Word, um, longhand on a paper, whatever. Longhand, is that is that our going away? Are kids learning how to write longhand anymore? It's coming back a little bit. I've got a, um, my, my brother is a high school teacher um, and 10 years ago or so he got super fascinated by uh, handwriting um, and the fact that they stopped teaching it in schools, literally stopped teaching it and kids stopped, you know, reading and writing. And so he ended up with kids who couldn't read handwriting from their parents. Yeah. Um, uh, his personal interest ended up in like going back for a couple centuries uh, the, over the history of American handwriting and got really good at it. But anyway, um, I, I think it's coming back a little bit, um, but it's, you know, on the way out. Uh, Chris, another similar thing, Chris Aldrich uh, was blogging with a typewriter, uh, Smith Corona, 1940 something typewriter, I think, uh, from um, the uh, IndieWeb uh, camp. Um, so that was a lot of fun to watch, especially when our uh, power strip, you know, we were at a cafe or power strip overloaded or something like that. And all the people laughed after like, oh my God. And Chris is like sitting there typing away. He's typing a blog post about how his typewriter still works even when everybody else doesn't have power. So, what are did, is, did it go online though, or I mean, was there uh, was there a transition? I, I don't I don't know his whole thinking on the subject. I appreciate a lot actually the way he's got his typewriter and his note cards and stuff like that. At the end, he takes a picture of it, and that's what gets uh, blogged. So he, he needs power at some point along the way. My my email device in the 1980s was an Olivetti Letter of 32 reporter's news uh, typewriter, which had a little case that I would take into Turkey Run Farm Park in Northern Virginia with some carbon paper, uh -huh, 
and I would type out letters to friends and I've just been going through old boxes and I found, I found a whole bunch of my old carbon copies of things I had sent and then the replies and it was just crazy. And, and I'm like, okay, so this box here represents a couple folders of correspondence in my modern email inbox. And it's much more beautiful and tangible and took a lot longer in this box with all the cards and funny folded letters and humor and drawings and all the stuff we're squeezing out with email. But we have emojis, right? That compensates it for totally the loss. It totally makes up for it. Yeah. That totally makes up for the loss. Yeah. And um, you Apple um, people can do the thumb thing. So, you know, you got that too. Exactly. We've got fireworks, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, good. Any other, Anyone else want to check in with... Uh, and uh, my apologies, I'm going to take my leave. I'll see you around. Thanks for the conversation, especially Thanks, Dave. Dave. Thanks for all the fish. Um, Rick, did you want to check in a bit? I know that uh, you have a manuscript you'd like us to look at and things like that. Um, you know, I'm flexible. Um, I, I did share something a while back, but I, <laughs> on an email. But I thought it'd be better if, if people um, have read it first. Uh, rather than just doing it here, because it, it's uh, it's a thought piece, so it's not something you read and just you know create something. It, it, the idea is to actually get people to uh, go beyond reflection in action to reflection on action, so to speak, um, and that requires some time to think about things. That's the the premise of that. So can might... you share the link to it again in the chat so that we know which one? Because I've got a bunch of you know, yours. I've shared a, shared a couple. And I'm just trying to remember which one it was now. I'll have yeah. to go. It was on MLK. Oh, yeah. That one. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah, you can do that one. Uh, I can find that. I'm just uh, got so many screens open at the moment. Let me just see if I can. That is what modern life is like. Yeah, exactly. Just give me a moment and I'll get to it. I don't, I don't know which of these is the, the MLK one. Huh. It, it, not... Look at the image. It'll, it'll be in the image there. But oh, I it, see. Yeah, I'm nearly there. Okay. Nearly there. Nearly there. Cool. Yeah, just a second here. Yeah, there's, there's one. And... Uh, I, actually, don't even, I don't even have this one in my brain. Keep going. Go ahead. Okay. No, actually, one thing I did do, I, I found it fascinating. I actually attended quite a few of the World Economic Forum sessions. Uh -huh. And, you know, I was thinking that, um, yeah, I don't know whether this organization or other organizations, or I want to propose the idea to other organizations, do you actually crowd swarm a group of people to go to it? Because you can go onto LinkedIn as things are going live, and I was writing in questions and whatever. Um, because it's, sort of, you know, in, in the stratosphere of, I just came from another group where they were talking about the elitism of the World Economic Forum. And, uh, you know, I was saying, yes, and not yes, but in that, you know, you know, they have constraints to work with. And it's so easy to, you know, take pot shots at them. Um, you know, the, uh, whatever his name, Kevin, who was the head of the Heritage Foundation, I don't know if you saw his um, you know, two minute uh, diatribe about the elitism. And it was such a political hatchet job. It was brilliantly done talking about the elites. I don't know if you saw it or not, but Kevin Roberts. Yeah, thank you. And, um, it, you know, so, you know, in terms of, of, of actually, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, they have a group called Uplift on it, which I haven't really got involved with, but it's supposed to be a platform for innovators but it's still a pretty high level and it really needs to have, you know, input. So uh, my suggestion for next year for organizations that are interested, the ones that I'm connected with is to say, why don't you take a group of people and say, let's start watching these things live and actually, you know, commenting on Cause it actually went up to LinkedIn. So you could put a comment in there. Uh, actually, I, I, the guy who just came out with the, um, the Oxford report um, about, you know, world of uh, inequality. I, I posted something and I reached out to him thinking, eh, will, he, will he even accept my invitation, so to speak? And he did. So, you know, in terms of, you know, trying to use um, 
uh, networking more effectively of events that are in a public forum, I think I'm I'm going to. I'm going to make a more concerted effort next year to do it because this year I sort of just did it on the fly. But I think next time I'll be much more purposeful in looking at what is actually on there. Who do I want to look at um, and um, see if there are organizations willing to to put their membership on to watching different things and generating comments and reactions to it. Thanks, Rick. That'd be very interesting. Rick, I don't know if now is the right time. At some point, I'd love to hear you because... As far as as long as I've known you, you've been working kind of around this equity moonshot concept, and you've continually worked it. I'd love to hear some of the process insights around, you know, how's it gone, and you know, what what kinds of lessons have you got? I mean, I just feel like you've been really devoted to it, and uh, it's really curious. I'd be just curious to know how it's gone. Yeah, well, actually, what I've been doing is I've working. I've been working on the sidelines of organizations, as you know, David. And I'm in many different organizations, so I'm trying to learn from different organizations of how they operate, and thinking about well, how can we create a learning? And I'm getting close to it now. Actually, I feel like okay, I've got a, I've had enough experience of different ecosystems, and I can see the strengths and weaknesses of different ecosystems. Thinking about well, how can we create something? that is deeper than what we currently have. Um, and, and so that the, you know, the, the blog post that I just shared with you, for example, um, could be, and, and it's, it's focused on questions and it's really to get people to, to create a space for generative dialogue. People have got to think about something events. They've got to ruminate on it, not just show up and, you know, BS about stuff, which we're very good at doing, but, you know, going a little bit deeper and it's really, trying to enable people to develop um, their an appreciation of the metacognition skills. Actually, there's a, a report that just came out, and I'll have to find it because I just glanced at it last night, talking about um, the rise of irrational thinking. No surprise. <laughs> and mm -hmm. a study demonstrating the rise of irrational thinking, and it was putting a lot of the attributions okay. to the misuse of social media, which is really... The reptilian brain it's the you know it's rubber necking it's it's all clickbait and just getting people aroused up and shooting the breeze and you know not really using their whole brains and i think we can use um you know these platforms to do it but we have to, you know I, I sort of regard myself as a sort of learning design architect i'm thinking well how can we create things that are very different and one of the reasons why i'm interested in neo books is that from my point of view we've said this before jerry um, you know, neo books to me should be something. I mean, my blog post, I go back and I get feedback. Somebody gets angry with me or whatever. I mean, I get so much crazy shit sometimes. And I'm thinking, actually, it's helpful to listen to crazy shit. Mm -hmm. because it, it helps you understand where the hell people are coming from. And if you don't understand where people are coming from, you're not going to be able to engage it. And I've had a few very interesting exchanges with people who I completely disagree with. But they keep on coming back, and that's what we need. We have we have to have engagement with people that we don't have any you know reason to want to you know getting connected with. And if we're gonna if we're gonna deal with this divisiveness, it means you've got to really work out ways of creating spaces where you can do things online, which is very different to you know Zoom calls. Where I went to one a couple of weeks ago called the Living Room Conversations. And they had a nice framework of how to have conversations, but it, you know, that's not where the action is. The action's in social media. So we have to master this far better than we than we have been doing if we're actually going to harness the benefits of AI. That's enough of my rant. There you go, David. I hope that wasn't too much of a download for you. <laughs> uh, just well, I, re I respect oh, the, yeah, the, 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 I feel for a lot of the stuff, perseverance matters, so. Oh, absolutely. Well, actually, I just came from the EXO meeting, and it was fascinating. There's a group there on AI, um, and there's a group. Uh, the EXO group is really fascinating, um, and I think I, I'm going to get more involved with that group. Um, the other one, actually, uh, I, David, I don't know if you've heard of a group. Uh, I only discovered this a couple of days called R-Future, and it's Regenerative Future. If you want to look them up, I, I listened to some of their stuff. And uh, I didn't have a lot of time. I wish I had, it was a four day event and I could only go to a couple of them. But what I really liked about it was I felt like there were kindred spirits, ways of thinking, 
about regeneration. I mean, one of the words that uh, you were talking about was growth. And what I put in there was regenerative flourishing. Can we, can we focus on regenerative flourishing as a way of not only our, our natural systems, but our human systems as well? So anyway, that's just a different spin on your take on growth, which I think Pete was having some differences with. Uh, uh, Rick, when I thank you for sending your article last week so I could have a little moment to read on it. And like I shared with you, if we had actually conversation, it would have created some kind of, um, it would have generated more questions and then relatability. Like for instance, how do you define freedom? Um, from, from my standpoint, freedom is like letting go of um, anger and anxiety and possessions. Um, versus, you know, freedom for all. Um, it's more of a mental state. But what my point is, is like, I'm working with Kylie and Trey on a regular basis to create um, more of a framework around supporting people that have mindful meetings, mindful based meetings, right. um, and talk about metacognition and, you know, the, ch the question changes the discussion and everything. But when we're speaking about the difference between productivity and like experience, um, as a learning experience designer, it's holding both and having the space that we can evolve and move forward and um, build and create. At the same time, people are being recognized, they're being heard, they're being acknowledged. And it's it takes quite a lot of um, expertise to do that unless there, unless there's a framework being used and, and agreed by, by all. So it's interesting when I get into a classroom or um, some kind of session that I'm facilitating be it on mindfulness or health and wellness. Um, if I come with an agenda, everyone doesn't get recognized on why they're there. And it's like the first 10 minutes, it has to be open agenda. It has to be um, completely um, the room's responsibility to decide what the agenda is or else it just becomes yet another meeting. So lots of thoughts about this. Just wanna share that I'm really fascinated by it all. and. Well, I have to say, you picked on one thing, very important thing, and that is before you even begin to answer the question, you have to define the terms. Because if you have a different framework of freedom to me, that's where a lot of the, this this crazy dialogue goes on. Because if you use the word equity and 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 somebody associates it with, with uh, you know, Marxism, that's their association, equal outcome, equal treatments, you know, holding people back, yada, yada, all that BS – you know, then you're going to be, you're not going to have a, so you have to even step back from the question to question the question to understand exactly what you're saying. And and the issue about agenda setting, I couldn't agree with you more that the, the uh, how well is shared decision-making decided? Now it's difficult to do it in real time, but if it's done iteratively over time where people are creating a sort of a, a landscape of agendas, where it emerges and the, the people who show up can then determine, okay, let's let's go. So I think there's a lot more to agenda setting. And I think part of the reason why people uh, have varying degrees of engagement is because if you don't buy into the agenda, you're not gonna listen as much. You're gonna tune out, you know? If it's not relevant to you at that moment in time, if it's relevant to you, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll get involved. So I think what you just impact there is a lot. And I just don't think we're nuanced enough on our Zoom calls about how to do it. Yeah, I mean, you can't notice that someone's checked out um, on a Zoom call, let alone in a in a classroom without a, a frame, a, a safe enough environment to be able mm -hmm. to check back in and tune in. Yeah. Yeah. Safety is incredibly important and people have to trust each other. Absolutely. And if you don't have those ground rules, set up at the beginning, then it's very difficult for people to be vulnerable where, yeah. you know, if they're not wanting to be vulnerable, it's very, there's little opportunity for growth. Right. And those ground rules have to be developed by the people in the room too. So, yeah. Or, 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 or having models of it that people. Right. Then, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So you have some ground rules about an engagement. Absolutely. But I just don't think we put the, the sweat equity into doing that very well. I just want to add that that's also a place that we have to recognize that not everybody is equal and you might have to develop skill. You know, sometimes I listen to people and they talk about trusting people and I'm thinking, why would I trust them? No, I shouldn't trust them. 
And that's that's reasonable. Well, and I think is, pretend yeah. it doesn't exist, but sometimes I hear people try to just like ride over that. No, people are different. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but like Jesse said, I think it's important whoever's in the room is going to shape that room. Mm -hmm. And that's a really important consideration. And it's because it changes. Yeah. My mind is going in a thousand directions at once. Um, well, take take one. If you can. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> well, partly interesting. Uh, Jesse, you were just saying uh, there was sort of in the air this idea of, of trusted spaces and all that kind of stuff, uh, and that's how creativity or innovation shows up. Or I'm, I'm probably lo loading the wrong words onto that, but but how necessary that is. And in a lot of cases, uh, sort of a dictatorial space where people are forced to do things causes a lot of creativity, and it, it can happen that way, and often does. Uh, Steve Jobs was notably a tyrant. And he would go and wreck people's desks and say, no, you're not working on this and throw throw what they were working on across the room. And then, you know, reassign. But, but, he, but he sort of knew how to corral genius talent to go produce like things like the iPhone, which, which shows up uh, at the end of that. And, and at, at the cost of people's emotional lives sometimes, but also sometimes at the benefit of getting someplace they couldn't have gotten without that sort of crushing pressure it's kind of weird i was i remember um there was a, a company called scient back in the dot-com era which was a system integrator and i learned about scient when the founder of scient eric greenberg who used to be a gartner group showed up in my in our offices in new york he had a deck a little deck and he says i have eight million dollars from benchmark and i'm going to start a company called scient uh would you like to join me because i was quitting the newsletter and moving west to california and i said you know i want to be independent so he said tell you what i'll give you an office i'll make you an advisor and i helped develop some of their first materials and we he put us in a conference room and later i learned that greenberg is an nlp master so nlp is not natural language processing nlp in this setting means neuro linguistic programming <clears throat> which is a way of mirroring pacing and influencing people's behavior and uh, you, you do a whole bunch of interesting things in NLP, which I actually kind of respect, even though it's a little kooky at the fringes. And so I remember uh, Eric would come into the room and sort of his, his eyes would kind of bulge out and he'd walk around and he'd say stuff. And we weren't locked in the room with no food. There was not that kind of pressure, but there was clearly pressure to create this, the, like these launch decks. And stuff came out of us that that we didn't know was there under that kind of pressure slash shaping slash I don't know what else was going on but but it was it was clear clear that we were like getting someplace that we wouldn't have gotten in a relaxed laid back really safe space and sometimes also people intentionally put themselves they stretch themselves they put themselves in some place where their safety isn't guaranteed and that lets them exceed so I'm so one little piece of what's eddying in my head is what I think personal safety is huge. I think people feeling safe to participate and all that is really important. And yet I've seen how sometimes different kinds of stress cause genius to squeeze out the other end. Um, and I, I'm not sure how I feel about all that. And, and sometimes people's lives are broken or people's brains are broken by the stress. Uh, and that happens a bunch as well. Uh, you know, there's some some places like Japan has a general work ethic where you don't take time off. You go to drinks after after the workday with your colleagues because that's just what everybody does. And FaceTime is as important as anything else in that in that work culture. And here we're like we've gone the opposite through pandemic and through whatever else. Lots of different examples here. And just to dovetail on that, Jerry, just in terms of what you just said, I think there's two ways of looking at it. one is do you create the safety so that conflicts can emerge that need to come out or conversely are the is the situation unsafe that brings out the conflicts and the question then becomes can you manage the conflict in a constructive or destructive manner so you know you're not always going to have safety does the conflict come out and does it does it is it a race to the bottom of you know uh, fundamental fundamentalist debating where you're just saying I'm right you're wrong or 
are you actually beginning to understand different perspectives so you can say oh okay i i, I didn't look at it like that i mean stacy just put in a comment about liberty and freedom and you know and and i think th those words are, are ones where people have certain assumptions about them and if you examine the assumptions and look at the relationship between them between equity and liberty you might see things differently but the problem is in the united states in particular there's such a monocular vision on the whole notion of freedom that it actually eclipses concerns about equality and equity so it's it's sort of a it's a reductionist perspective on ethics that is incredibly detrimental and it doesn't see the complexity of different polarities of how values and virtues commingle in complex ways and uh, and we don't make distinctions between virtues and values people talk about values but they're, they're not very literate in terms of talking about the ethics of virtues Brad Jesse yeah so there's a quote that says a child that is not embraced by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth right <laughs> it's very similar to adults when you go into any type of conversation yeah it's safety everything being able to define things together and see the different lenses of it all it's mm -hmm. everything yeah so how does safety like there are some safe spaces that aren't really safe this is the this is the the, the rightest argument about campus political correctness where saying things that are too far on the right are unsafe and are are those careers are ended you know there's there's cancel culture there's all that kind of stuff there's there's some really strong critiques of what are supposed to be safe spaces but sort of safe for whom and how i think is part of the question and, and what's the right balance to do that um and sometimes sometimes there's an outsider opinion that's probably right in the long run but nobody in the space wants to hear it like not a soul it's it this the, the space is unsafe for that opinion to be presented um and how does that work you, it, again as stacy did reiterate the that the, the room has to decide that mm -hmm. every time and it changes every single time that the conversation changes and the people change the the answer to that changes so it's not like this fit for all universal answer <laughs> it has to be posed to the room That's why I was so taken by that word fairness, though. Yeah. Because it that's what I look for in anybody that I talk to, whether I agree with them or disagree with them. Do they seem to me to be fair-minded? That's such a skill, or you know, whether it's innate, wherever it comes from, that's undervalued. I cannot and will not have a conversation with somebody that doesn't have the fairness. Even if they agree with me, there's no point to it. Um, and I just think that we need to do more to show what that is or point out even in ourselves when we're not seeing something clearly. Um, again, so for me, a lot of it's about self-awareness, but doing it in a public way so that maybe we recognize in each other things that we didn't see in ourselves if that makes any sense. And and part of that self-awareness requires self-regulation. Mm -hmm. And I think we're like off the beat on self-regulation. And that's like the number one thing that I'm dedicated to for myself and for those around me. Um, it's a big word. It's how to, how to manage energy when you're in conversation, how to manage yourself. It's self-leadership at its best. Mm -hmm. you know when, when people speak i i this is a, a very simple heuristic but i often th think okay is this person talking out of the neocortex the limbic amygdala or reptilian system and depending upon their emotional reactivity they will regress to the lowest level uh, and sometimes commenting on the process can be helpful for putting the brakes on the um the escalation um downwards um but you know but even to have the language just of what i just said and people to be aware of okay there are times when we all get emotionally reactive but is that 
emotional reactivity being driven by, more by your neocortex or by your reptilian brain. So Rick, you're reminding me that Klaus's neo book explicitly brings in spiral dynamics right. and the different colored layer models and uses it to say, hey, different people are at different levels. We need to actually shape the message of regenerative agriculture and everything else to the right level. And he's using chat GPT to create some scripts at those different levels. And yeah. it strikes me from what you just said that that's very similar. It's just a different model of, of, of our brains. But it strikes me that like Trump is connecting really beautifully with a quarter of the population in this country by appealing to their reptilian brains. Exactly. But that's that's a very successful strategy right now. And I think the intercept might also need to work at the reptilian level. That that the answer is not to rise above that and to be like oh. all 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 like smarter in the neocortex. And by the way, the neocortex gets way too much credit in the world. Um, it's like two two spoonfuls of pudding in the front of our heads that seem to control everything. I don't know. Um, <laughs> it's an oversimplistic model and it's a critique of that framework. And I yeah, it's a simple heuristic. It's fine, but when you start going deeper, it's much more complex than that. Yes. Yeah. Bingo. Something yeah. that I learned recently was. Um, the emotional reactions that people have are not uh, interpretations that the brain is having, but uh, more predictions. Say more. Yeah, they're they're um, our reaction is it's it's like our brain is in this dark aquarium and it's trying to make sense of the outside world without knowing really what's happening. So what its job is to do is to predict based on past experiences. Right. And we think we're actually thinking, but the brain is actually predicting. And then it comes out in emotion, maybe fear-based, like you said, as a victim mm -hmm. uh, for Trump's uh, strategy. And it's, uh, yeah, it's Hidden Brain two weeks ago um, about feelings. And it's how, um, it's not interpretations, but predictions that the brain is making. And, and when I start sharing that with people in a room, um, just, I've been attempting to do this about three times in the last two weeks, just by telling them that we're all just predicting <laughs> here, uh, our brain is predicting, it shifts, it shifts something. It does become less reactive because we start thinking about, well, what am I predicting now? And there's a gap between um, reaction and, you know, there, it, it gets a little longer. The more that gap happens, the more self-regulation self we have. So it's it's a, a brain hack just by sharing that. I think it's a great brain hack. I, I would add to a, maybe a little nuance. I'd be interested in what your perspective is. And the, the, the predictions are also predetermined by implicit biases. So yes, that the predeterminants are that so you're anticipating something. Yes. And then, and then and really what you're doing is is shifting out of reflection in action to reflection on action, which is moving more into the metacognition field. But I want to return to something you said, Jerry, because I've been thinking about if we're going to take on the reptilian brain, you got to be a you got to be a smarter reptilian, you know? So I'm going to share with you. This is a if you if you click on that link, you'll see this image that I created with um, nice. Dolly. OK, <laughs> I just blown away by this image. I just thought, wow, it took me about five minutes to to create it. Um, but yeah. you'll, you'll see the title of it. So we need to start talking about the mass psychosis of the big lie. I mean, this is a sort of, you know, the fool aid. I, I, I don't know if you've seen some of the spoofs on uh, on on Trump's fool aid, and there's a there's a meme there as well. I mean, this is the sort of stuff you have to get down to. And it's not to make any difference to the base. It's to get the independents out and say, do you want this asshole to be your president for the next four years? That's what you're appealing to. You're not going to change the base. You're only going to change the middle ground a few percentage points, and that's all it needs. Anyway, enjoy reading that one. Thank you. I haven't heard the term fool aid. I'm going to read up on it when we hang up. Yeah, it's 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 there's if you go on YouTube, you'll see the the fool aid. I think the fool aid needs to get even, you know, that needs to go viral. Um so but I think that 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 meme there I thought was really good. So interesting. Yeah. Other thoughts on this? I, I'm just curious. Oh, sorry. 
No, go ahead. It's not important. You have a talk, Stacey. Go ahead. I was just going to ask how many of you have seen the bizarre ad of Trump comparing, you know, saying about how God created Trump with hands soft enough to deliver his grandchild. Have you all seen that? Yeah. No, you have it. Oh, um, yeah. The, so the only place that I do, I've I've been staying away from social media as much as I can. Unfortunately, I mean, even though I really enjoy it, but where I will interact is with the very, very religious. That's even though they seem like they're off the deep end. I'm feeling some element of fairness there, even if they can't help themselves. So it's sort of like it's for me. And that's where the um, wanting to be better comes in. For me, it's almost like a challenge. Can I speak to them in their own language and use mm -hmm. their own logic to show them, oh, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. Um, and the same with certain libertarians. So those are the two groups that I like to speak to because I know I can find common ground if I really try hard enough, if they're fair players. So I don't know, just and, when you showed that picture and that whole commercial is just killing me. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I put in the a link to that commercial that Stacey just mentioned and also a link to the farmer video that it's based on. And God Made a Farmer is a thing that dates uh, back a lot further by Paul Harvey. I don't know how old, I don't know when. So uh, in 1978, Paul Harvey did a speech called So God Made a Farmer, which got turned into a video. Uh, so that predates God made Trump. They borrowed, they basically borrowed that trope, reappropriated it to Trump, et cetera. Um, and you had, I, I, there was something else that was swirling in my head, but it's gone now. Um, you know, I just want to, go ahead. To, to your word fair. I, I think there's different ways of looking at fairness. There's the fairness of the individual, which is fair-minded, willing to open to, opposed to being closed-minded. Mm -hmm. So even though they may have a diametrically point of view, are they fair-minded? Will they listen to your viewpoint? So that's one thing. But there is fairness at interactional level and at a societal level. How do you co-construct co the meaning of the word? And that's one of the things we don't do. And so we get locked into our different frames of the words, and then we just go to battle because we have different value structures underpinning those different definitions. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I've got a bugaboo about, um, you know, the whole notion of our language about values. Um, you know, we're, we, we have you know, this war of identity politics based on, upon collecting, conflicting value systems. But if we were to develop ethical identities, based on virtues, then, then you're going to move to a more fair-minded place. What does one of those look like? What does it look like? Yep. Um, what it looks like is that um, that I'm more attached to my virtues than my values. And so if an, a, a political identity is, a tra is, is a attached to a hierarchical value system that, you know, um, Jonathan Haidt talks about between the conservative liberal minds, there's just small differences in the priorities of the value systems that causes the great divisions. So that's political identity. On the other hand, if you have an ethical identity based upon your own personal const constellation of virtues, and there's a website called Values and Actions where you can go and do a survey and actually profile your own virtues. What are your what you know what are your virtues? And so if you base it upon your ethical identity and not your political identity, then there's a better chance that we can use values of uh, virtues to guide our values. What well, problem is, is we, we do it the other way around. So that's a mindset shift. Can you say more about virtues? What do you mean by our virtues? Well, uh, let me very simply values are just to contrast it. Values are about setting priorities on what's important to you. All right. So that's values. Virtues is about doing good. It's a non-hierarchical way of thinking about what your particular uh, character strengths are. There's a book that was published, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago called um, Virtues and Value Strengths by uh, Peterson and um, Martin Seligman. And it was sort of like a typology. It's a, it's a hell of a book. <laughs> 
talks about the framework of 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 um, virtues and character strengths, and it's the opposite to you know the the DMS four car car categorization of uh, mental illnesses, and so we don't actually work. We don't really do a very good job of cultivating virtues, both in religion and in education, and we're not very literate on either. Was the book Virtues and Character Strengths or Value Strengths? It's I think it's Virtues and Character Strengths. I'll have to find it. If you look at Peterson and Marty Seligman, um, it's it, yeah. Uh, but I don't know, yeah, Peterson, Marty Seligman, uh, Character Strengths and Virtues is the yeah, panel. that's it. Yeah, and then if you go to a website, it's a it's a private foundation in um, Cincinnati that have been supporting this work about how to get. Um, the education of virtues into school systems, and I've I've used the actual um, the survey itself as a way of uh, inviting people to complete the 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 survey online themselves. So it gives them a framework of looking what their virtues are. To me, I, I'm less in, interested in the actual results. I'm more interested in the conversations you have with yourself and with others about what you think your character strengths are. So it's it's a go ahead, Stacey. So I remember Maya Angelou said that um, the most important virtue was courage, because without courage, you couldn't uphold all the other virtues. And the reason, at least for me, that that's so important is because speaking your truth or speaking whatever it is does come with consequences. And that does have to do with safety. And you do need courage to be willing to uphold whatever it is that you feel you're upholding. And that's where community comes in. I think as a community, we could, if we shifted away from retribution and more towards you know, forgiveness and acceptance, um, I think we could change it so it wasn't so scary to be wrong or to have an alternate point of view. Um, I can tell you that with the whole thing it, with the Israeli crisis right now, I'm in a group that um, supports Israel. And I've been very quiet because I'm very upset that what happened is you wound up having all these MAGAs co converging with people, you know, Democrats, let's say, you know, people, I wouldn't say we're far left, but people like me, let's say people who think like me. And now they're cohorts, and I'm sorry, but if you didn't care if migrants were separated from their parents and put in cages, I don't really trust your virtues and your values and know that I want your support. And it makes it difficult for me to have an uncomfortable conversation because I know there are people that are ready to just destroy me. And what's the point? If I'm not gonna make any progress, why just stick myself out there to be beat up because there's no room for nuance you know you can't have a convert you know you can't have a conversation where you try to create nuance because there are people that just want you know i mean they're like advertising get your guns you know get your training you know all this stuff that is so against what i believe well it's funny you should say that i'll put another blog post in which i did about this about healthcare professionals and their role and their perspective on this issue. And I, I, I haven't gone back to it, but I, I got involved with one guy who was completely misconstruing me as being pro-Palestinian. And I had to reiterate, take a chunk out of it and put it in and said, did you read this? And he clearly, I don't, either he did read it and completely ignored it because of his biases, um, but you know, it's it's got so i mean i don't know i mean the, it, the cancer culture in this country is so bad Damn. against palestinian it is unbelievable and so i mean Amapur had this palestinian artist who was going to have an exhibit that she'd spent three years doing at the indianapolis uh university and they canceled her and she was interviewed there it was it was uh it was amazing to to hear her account of it and and that's you know this is just you know this is you know reptilian brain stuff so um ami dar who is an old friend and the founder of idealist.org which matches people who want to volunteer with volunteering opportunities he and mm -hmm. i've been in touch for a long time 
And recently, right after the Gaza incident, he did a couple tweets that just went viral. And for the first time in his life, he his his numbers just tripled. And all of a sudden, he'd say something, and a lot of people would respond. And he was getting he was getting sort of important people following him, and then saying, "No, saying thank you for what you're doing." And he he struck some note that I haven't been able to figure out yet, but he struck some note that that could work that middle ground somehow. And and he is an Israeli who was raised partly in Peru and and a, a bunch of other sorts of things. But but um, something about how he was saying what he was saying really resonated. In a, in I think a, a really great way. And he's trying to figure out what what you know. Gosh, I've gone viral. Now what do I do? Do you have Do you have a link to some of that stuff? Because I think sure. This you know trying to navigate that. This people are going to take pot shots at, on either side, which I got. Yeah, uh, and you know how how do you how do you maintain that position of equanimity that you know you're looking at the uh, you know anyway if you read the article you'll get the gist of what I was saying and I was using a lot of other references in that uh, yeah seeing a bit more of a a nuanced story not from my perspective just because I cited the articles people were immediately assuming that I enjoyed sure. the article right. I think that link is going to break because it doesn't alias any forward anymore. Let me fix the link and see if that works. Okay, thanks. Um, and what I would do is I would just uh, take this account and scroll back. Okay. No, scroll back. To, scroll back to the the date of the Gaza attack, and you know the things he did. In, there we go. So uh, I just took away the bang, the, the pound bang, and it works. Let me put that in our chat now. Better. There. So just scroll back to the date of the attack and you'll see like the things he said. Um... All righty. Well, this has been a very interesting conversation, all in the spirit of Neo books. <laughs> Indeed. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. I've got a whole bunch of things to go research. <laughs> As if you need to open your mind even more, right, Jerry? <laughs> yeah, crazy. It, it's very interesting because I feel sometimes like I'm in the middle of a maelstrom and like while swirling in the currents, I'm busy like, oh, this connects over here and uh, this thing here, these, oh, and these two people should meet. And uh, it's like, whoa. So there's a limit to the, uh, th there's no limit to artificial intelligence, but there is to the human capacity. Alas, it is too true. Um, so I, I, shall we wrap our call? Sounds good. Sounds like we're sort of getting to that point. Uh, unless somebody wants to bring up a topic or keep going. Well, I've got one for you, but we don't have to keep going. But uh, we why, were, why don't you share it with us? I don't know if you were, I don't know if your ears were burning yesterday, Jerry, but we were, uh, I was talking with Claudia. So my, my wife's taking a new job. She's going to be the chief social impact officer for the school of public health at Cal. Oh, cool. Um, wow. yeah, cool position. It doesn't have to exist before. So what do you do? And, um, one of the things I was saying is that she really needed to talk to you about the, I was thinking, we were, I was thinking about the retreats Yeah, and like the, you know, kind of how do you do like the learning and cooperation in the retreats and how do you model some of that? <laughs> but, but more broadly, the question is kind of like, what do you do? Yeah. Um, it's a great have, so they have, a, they have a, uh, I guess the school, the university has a change makers program where you can kind of take a couple of courses and stuff through the, through different, all the different schools, I guess, have change maker classes. And if you do enough of them, you get a certificate in change making. Um, but then the public they don't school, tell you is that it's how to make change in the drawer at Starbucks. Like that'll be $4 know. and 12 cents back to you, man. <laughs> exactly. I don't, I'm not exactly, I was listening. I was, I was sitting in a, 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 a we went. Oh, they did. We went to the TEDx Berkeley the other day, and I was sitting in front of some uh, student who was saying, "Yeah, yeah, I'm going to take uh, this change making class." And she says, "I think I get a certificate. I, I don't know." It was kind of like really she didn't know what she was getting into either. That's so, funny. <laughs> but well, uh, David, on that note, very quickly, very quickly, I, I want to develop an equity muse, which is a change agent thing. It's about asking the questions. So if your wife is interested in, in pilot testing an equity muse, I, I'd love to get it to undergraduates. So let me know if it piques her curiosity or not. Jesse, you were going to say? Uh, well, I, I 
received a master's in creative from the Center of Creative Change from Antioch uh, year, 20 years, 10, lots of years ago, okay? Um, and over the years of practicing, there is no change management. You can't manage change, but um, really what it comes down to is collaboration, locking arms every single time, locking arms. And it's so weird how when you when, when I notice nonprofits or leaders that are thought leaders and they're attempting to uh, influence change, they stay isolated in their efforts. And yet they there's so many different partners they could have had to uh, accelerate that impact. And it's weird how we it do is. that. And um, so for everything that I do, it requires uh, inviting people to the table, even the people that I don't think should be at the table are people that could maybe accelerate more than I thought. And this is my version of right now, um, bringing collaborators to connect the dots of products and thought leaders and tools and to be able to impact food. But um, it doesn't matter what co topic we're talking about, it's collaboration, that's change. Well, we were talking about the, part of the reason we came up with the Jerry's Retreat thing was the, um, she, we, I was asking you if she was gonna teach anything and she was waffling a little bit about whether she, I don't think she asked you right away. But that um, facilitation was the first thing that came to mind to teach, right? Because there's just so much, I think, kind of insight in the facilitation technologies. And we just don't give it nearly enough credence to like, you know, how do you create, what are the right formats that create, you know, a connection and, and you know, how do you do it in different settings and how do you do it lightweight and heavyweight and you know, you guys, what formats can you do? And, are you guys aware of Howard Rheingold's materials on this? Uh, you know, I mean, I guess I know Howard stuff. I mean, I haven't really thought about it in the context. No. Yeah. So he taught at Cal and Stanford sort of collaboration and, uh, online stuff. And he created a syllabus that he posted online. He, he's, he's had a whole bunch of materials he's put online. Um, I can probably give you some links to it, but he's, he's uh -huh. lovely. He's in Mill Valley. Uh, and, uh, you could go for a walk in the church of Mount Tam with him. There you go. Uh, All right. And that would be pretty cool. Uh, yeah, Howard is a deep resource on on these topics. Yeah, I would not have thought I didn't it didn't come to mind. So perfect, thank you. So I'm yeah, sure. I was thinking about things like your five minute universities and stuff yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's all kinds specific. all kinds of fun things. So I've just put a link to my brain for Howard's bibliography. If you then go up to Howard, uh, you'll see under it tons of articles. He posts on Patreon a lot. Uh, and uh, I can look some more, but in the middle of all this is a whole bunch of wisdom, uh, distilled wisdom about how to do this. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, David, for opening that little Pandora's box. <laughs> you never know which box is going to explode in front of you. Um. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, and if, if you and or Claudia want to talk about it, I'm happy to get on a Zoom and, and chat. That'd be great. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, you will we'll, we'll definitely be talking. And if you're down this way, you're making your return, your, we're gonna a return fly, visit to the motherland. We're going to fly over your head this weekend where uh, April and I are going to a workshop in San Diego Friday through Sunday. So we'll wave on our way over, but we're not stopping in, in SF, alas. Well, we've got, we've got the spare bedroom now. So we're ready. Awesome. Thank you. That's great. Great to see everybody. Thanks, everybody. Good luck on your workshop. Lovely Have call. Fun. Thank you. Bye, Thank Bye you. everyone. Bye. Bye.